by a semi-hurricane, actually, and couldn't make it, so I'm here um, now, and I've actually added some more data to this talk uh, than what I was going to present in March. But I'm going to talk today about, obviously, you heard about the hurricanes impacting the Caribbean. One of them came here, too. Um, so I'm going to give you a little overview of what we've done in terms of assessing the impacts of the hurricanes. And I, the, the title gets to comparing the impacts of the hurricane um, to some other catastrophic events that have happened in the Virgin Islands over the last couple of decades. Um, okay, so for those of you who might not know, the U.S. Virgin Islands are located next to Puerto Rico. So there's three um, little islands, you need to orient yourself to Florida, within the northeastern Caribbean. Um, the three islands are St. Thomas, St. John, and St. Croix. And they, St. Thomas and St. John are located on the same shelf as the British Virgin Islands to the east with a population of about 31,000. But we are right next door to Puerto Rico and its neighboring <laughs> islands of Calabria and Vieques with a population of about 3.3 .3 million. So we're right next to those. St. Croix is kind of out on its own, uh, separated by the Puerto Rican Trench. So that's just to orient you geologically where we are. Uh, in terms of population, of the three islands, St. John actually has the smallest population. It's primarily a national park, so it's only about 4,000 people. St. Thomas has the um, highest population, highest density of people, too. It's sort of the port location. That's where I live and where uh, most of the marine science uh, center faculty and staff live. Um, St. Croix uh, also has a population around the same as St. Thomas, but it's sort of less dense, so it's spread out. St. Thomas or St. Croix is a lot flatter than St. Thomas. Um, I'm going to focus most of my talk on impacts to St. Thomas and St. John, mainly because that's St. Thomas is where I live, and that's where we've done a lot more of the research. I have just a, one little slide about some of the damage in St. Croix, uh, but all three of these islands were really impacted by the hurricanes. So here's the port of St. Thomas in Charlotte Amelie. And this is where we're a huge tourism-based economy. So tourism counts for a large percentage of our income. We have a big cruise ship industry. Um, the cruise ships have actually come back. But you can see it's really densely populated along the coastlines. Um, and we have coral reefs all along the coasts. Um, and we also have a large percentage of our reefs are located uh, offshore and in the mesophotic zone, so in deeper reef areas, like up down to 100 meters. So what is a catastrophe? <laughs> well, a catastrophe is this. <laughs> this is Hurricane Irma. Um, it passed the U.S. Virgin Islands territory on September 6th with Category 5 uh, strength uh, winds. So here's Puerto Rico. And these little pink blips are the U.S. Virgin Islands. The eye of the storm went right over uh, the British Virgin Islands, which were really badly impacted. And the eye wall actually affected um, St. John. So we were right in the middle of the eye. That was like the first time that we were in the cone of a hurricane a week before it hit, and then we were dead center of that cone uh, when it hit because all of us were like, oh, we're in the middle of the cone. There's no way we're going to get hit because usually the cones move all over the place. No, we were directly hit. Um, it was scary because Saturday it was a Category 3, Sunday it was a Category 3, Monday it was a Category 4, Tuesday it was a Category 5, and then it hit on Wednesday. So it really ramped up very fast. And a lot of us were not that prepared. <laughs> or we were kind of prepared, but um, I, there were a lot of lessons learned from this uh, in terms of preparation, not just for the storm, but for the aftermath of the storm. And I, I can't fit all of that into one presentation, so I'd love to talk to anybody um, if they have more questions about it. After the passage of the storm, the land was really <coughs> greatly affected. So this is um, aerial images or remote sensing images of prior to the storm. Um, August 25th is the day after my daughter was born. Um, so she was only 12 days old when the hurricane hit. And I have a son who's four years old, too. So there is a big personal side to a lot of this, these impacts. Um, this is the day, three days after, or four days after the storm hit. And you can see just the, the green is gone. And that's because almost every leaf was blown off of the trees. There was just nothing left. It was incredible strength force um, winds. This is Megan's Bay, which is a really popular tourism destination. Um, this beach uh, receives a lot of tourists every year, and it was just completely denuded of leaves. Um, some devastation photos. I know probably a lot of people like to see this, but um, 
it really hits home. This is Cruise Bay St. John. This is where uh, a lot of tourists go. Um, it's the main center of St. John. And there were just ships on, on shore. This is the, the, actually the, the ferry dock area. This is 2-2 High Rise, which is a um, community housing in St. Thomas. Actually, one of my graduate students uh, was in here with his brother. And when I talked to him, he's now in um, Florida, but when I talked to him, I asked, well, how did it go? And he said, well, we hung on. I mean, that was <laughs> his response. Um, people's apartments were blown completely through. This was our post office. So Kara had actually sent me a box of baby goodies um, for our newborn daughter, and I didn't get it. And amazingly, it did survive, though, that box. But a lot of other mail did not. This was our airport. It was very difficult to get in and out after the hurricanes. They didn't open it for about a month afterwards. Um, we are still not back up to original flight schedules, so that's part of why I didn't show up, too. There were just not a lot of redundant flights to get onto. Um, they have really done a good job cleaning this airport up. The medical center of the hospital, um, one of my graduate students, Mariah Sevier, was pregnant at the same time I was, and she actually gave birth during the hurricane um, while the roof was ripping off. It was, she's got an incredible story. She was on um, some TV show or something, and Michael Bloomberg, when he sent down a bunch of supplies to the Virgin Islands, uh, offered to send her to her family in California on a private jet, so she took that offer, but she's back now. Um, and she just finished her thesis. Actually, she's turning it in today, so I'm very proud of her. <laughs> she got it done. Uh, this is our favorite grocery store. Um, all of this is not lettuce, which somebody asked me. It's actually insulation from the, uh, the roof. This is called Costulus. It's kind of like a Costco, but for the Virgin Islands. Uh, my favorite sushi restaurant, which was sad. It hasn't come back yet. Uh, and these hurricanes really had a big impact on like the spirituality of people in the Virgin Islands, just everything, there was just devastation everywhere, and it's, it's still a lot of this looks like that. You know, so this is, um, there's a lot of Seventh-day Adventists on the island, and this is what one of their main churches looks like. Um, and like I mentioned, my favorite sushi place got damaged. So there's a lot of, you know, just places you used to go to. My son liked to go there to watch the tarpon. It's, they're just no longer, they're completely wiped clean. Uh, then after that, <laughs> So we had a two-week relief, and then Hurricane Maria came. Um, after Hurricane Irma passed, the Puerto Rico and St. Croix were not badly affected by Irma, and they actually were sending boats to St. Thomas and St. John to try to get people off and sending supplies. I mean, they put in all of these people just out of the goodness of their hearts were putting in all of this effort because there, wasn't, there was hardly anything getting to St. Thomas and St. John. And then... Maria comes and its eye wall went right over St. Croix and hit Puerto Rico. San Juan was devastated, as you probably heard more about in the news. Um, St. Thomas and St. John, which are up here, were you know, within the path of the storm. We did see Cat 5 hurricane strength um, winds, but mainly we got tons and tons of rain. But what wasn't damaged by Irma in the Virgin Islands um, was damaged by Maria. So this is nighttime aerial images um, before the storm. So in July of 2017, and this is afterwards, St. Croix basically disappears off the map. St. Thomas had some power back by that point, but not very much. So it was really devastating. I personally at my house did not receive power until 102 days after the storm's passage. And I got power pretty early compared to a lot of people. So um, Puerto Rico, a lot of Puerto Rico is still without power. It's kind of amazing. And I still know people without power on St. Thomas. So I had been through storms before in Florida when I was in grad school. And I remember how horrible it was to not have power for four days. Well, <laughs> 102 days will change your perspective on things. One thing that is changing, though, which um, might be interesting, the engineering group in here, is that uh, a lot of people have bought Tesla, back Tesla batteries for their solar panels. A lot of people have solar in the Virgin Islands. Um, so a lot of people now have backup batteries and can go completely off the grid. Because if you had solar and you had backup batteries, you were pretty much good to go. I mean, you had to monitor your energy, but it was really important. Um, so again, I was devastated by the passage of Maria uh, in St. Thomas and in St. Croix. Maria just brought a ton of rain, um, lots of landslides. 
Um, this is a very populated area of St. Thomas, Bavoni, um, just completely flooded. This is downtown um, near the waterfront in St. Thomas. So my institution is the University of the Virgin Islands. I'm, I've been a research professor there since 2010. Uh, UVI has two campuses, uh, one on St. Thomas, its largest campus, and one on St. Croix. The Marine Science Center is right here on the water, which is great. We have access to the marine environment. It's wonderful. Um, UVI was really badly, badly affected by these storms. So this is the business building at the top of the um, hill in St. Thomas. We actually just got our estimates back. Um, there was $80 million worth of damage to the university but we only had $20 million worth of insurance. And so the plan to rebuild is still a bit sketchy and we're not totally sure. We've been told marine science is gonna be given uh, priority, but again, that construction won't begin until the end of the year, if then. So it's gonna be a long road to recovery. Why does marine science need um, to be recovered? Well, this is our building uh, right on the water, but it wasn't a very sturdy building. And so you see the, the pretty much ripped clean off the downstairs was okay, but um, the roof came off. This is my office after a recovery mission. My office did really well. <laughs> this is my husband's office, Tyler Smith. He had the corner office. Not great to have the corner office during a hurricane. <laughs> um, he was able to recover some things, but this was just really a mess. This was the director of marine sciences office and our uh, part of our conference room. Uh, this is the downstairs facing up, you can see the nice view to the sky that we now have. Uh, the water tables survived. This is our seawater tables. Um, they were okay, but the seawater system was impacted. So we had just started a coral nursery program. We had just collected a bunch of corals. They all died. <laughs> it was really sad as a coral researcher to know that, you know, when I left, I left those corals to die and there was nothing we could do about it. Um, a lot of people couldn't, I was off island, I was, managed to get a last flight off, but a lot of people couldn't even get to marine science to check on anything for almost a week because there was just, the roads were impassable. Um, some of you might recognize this guy. So this is Sinai Haptis, he's a, a, a research faculty with us at UVI, he is a graduate of USF. Um, he was on island, his family's from St. Thomas, and so he led a mission to salvage research equipment from the Marine Science Center. Um, and that's how we knew that all of this had happened. He managed to get a bunch of stuff out. Uh, so the recovery started. Um, these, this is a huge uh, ship full of lineman trucks, uh, or line trucks, I'm not sure what they're called, uh, for putting the power back up. So you just saw these all over the island. Uh, hundreds and hundreds of them are still on the island. Um, this is Tutu, one of the main uh, pop most populated areas of St. Thomas. You can see all the FEMA tarps. So FEMA came in and was able to put tarps up. Unfortunately, it still looks like this. Most people have not rebuilt their um, roofs, so it's a little scary. Coast Guard came in and recovered a lot of ships that were um, destroyed or downed. Uh, a lot of any place that was a big field, this is the old cricket field, um, any place that was a field became sort of a trash site that they could bring a lot of the debris to. So you can see they separate it into sort of metals and um, other debris these are refrigerators from all over the island. This is still on the island. There's a huge debate about how to get this garbage off the island. Our landfill was actually close to closing anyway, and, there's, and it's an unlined landfill. So there's a lot of this garbage just all over the islands, um, and anytime it rains, a lot of that stuff goes straight into the water. So there's a lot to be done to investigate what the impacts are from that. Um, also, people had a lot of garbage after the hurricanes. So we don't have typical garbage pickup, like you, you know, we don't roll our garbage cans out to the uh, side of the street. Instead, we have to take them to dumpsters placed in strategic locations around the island. Usually there's one dumpster, like full to the top with garbage. This is what it looked like every day for about four months. People just cleaning out their houses, tons of garbage. This, this location is on a place what's called a gut, which is an ephemeral stream area that filters right into the marine environment too. So all of this is, um, or any of the chemicals or leaches, whatever, leach is leaching out and going direct directly into the uh, marine environment. So speaking of the marine environment, let's talk about some science. Uh, I'm gonna give you a little perspective that we are still not recovered. So if there's any way that you think you might help with recovery, please, um, 
uh, join us in recovering. That would be great. Okay, so impacts on USVI communities. So I was going to talk to you today about a little bit of work we've done on seagrass, some shallow acropora dominator reefs, so that's the branching coral, and then mainly about the mid-depth to deep orbicella dominator reefs. Those are the boulder star corals. There are, um, and I'll talk today mostly about, um, or sorry, I'm going to first start with the seagrass communities, but I did want to mention that there, there are other assessments going on. Um, looking at mangrove, eco mangrove ecosystems, so Kristen Wilson-Grimes at UVI, Carolyn Rogers at USGS are looking at the mangroves. There was huge impacts to the bat populations because all that um, vegetation was gone and all the fruit that they depended on, native trees, um, and then turtle populations are also being looked at um, because a lot of the seagrasses were affected. So for seagrass communities, uh, mainly the data we have is a long-term project looking at seagrasses in Brewer's Bay. So this is St. Thomas again. Brewer's Bay, the Marine Science Center, is right on the um, coastline of Brewer's Bay. Um, every year, uh, Dr. Tyler Smith, who is also my husband, his seagrass lab <laughs> goes out with the grad students and estimates uh, seagrass percent cover using several transects and quadrats within those transects. Uh, they estimate the percent cover of each type of seagrass. So up until about 2013, uh, the main seagrasses in the U.S. Virgin Islands were Thalassia, this broadleafed um, seagrass, Syringodium, and Halidule. Um, after that, we uh, experienced the invasion of the Halophila stipulaceae invasive seagrass, which is coming from the Mediterranean. So this is some of the data from that seagrass lab starting in 2009. So 2010, we were impacted by a hurricane, Hurricane Earl, primarily affected Brewer's Bay, and it ripped out most of that seagrass. So it dro dropped from percent cover over here of around almost 30% down to nearly nothing, uh, dropped again, started to recover by 2013. 2013 is when we first saw Halophila in the territory, and 2014, it started to invade in Brewer's Bay. And it's a really interesting data set now. We didn't realize what was going to happen when we set up this lab for the grad students. But in 2015, 2016, um, Halophila had started to really take over that bay. Um, and Hurricane Irma and Hurricane Maria did knock it back, but it is still primarily Halophila. So now we actually have a graduate student whose master's thesis project is looking at the um, sort of the competitive dynamics of Halophila as it returns to Brewer's Bay. So that just in imagery, this is the area where they do the transects. Um, so this is February 7th. You can see we usually have mooring balls and boats all over the place. This is the day after Hurricane Irma. Um, and you can kind of see from this imagery that all that seagrass was just ripped out completely. And so the turtles followed this too. Uh, a lot of the acoustic tracking shows that the turtles left. We don't know where they went, but they left, and people care about turtles, so that's important. <laughs> and now they're starting to come back. I mean, I care about turtles too, but I like coral. <laughs> um, I like coral more. Uh, anyway, so the, um, the turtles left too, but there were major impacts to the seagrass communities. We're, I think we're going to be funded by NOAA CRCP to do a more broad-scale assessment of seagrass communities around the Virgin Islands. So getting to the shallow acroporid communities, um, this is actually the work done by our first year graduate students. So I'm really proud to say that our first year graduate students, we didn't lose a single one. None of them <laughs> dropped out or none of them got you know, blown away by the storm. Um, they actually became closer and they made t-shirts. I mean, that's really cute. So um, this is our first year graduate student cohort. We make them every spring. We make our grad students do a big capstone project together where they have to do something of relevance for the territory. Usually it's a um, uh, science-based project that can be published. And so this year, we had them look at the impacts of the hurricanes on natural versus outplanted acropora communities. So we have two coral nurseries in St. Thomas that we recently took over from the Nature Conservancy. Um, and we out, those are outplanted each year. We have the locations of where they were outplanted plus near um, natural communities. So this cohort wanted to go assess the impacts because last year's cohort was actually looking at differences between outplanted and natural communities. So there was a great baseline data set. Um, sites included, so here's again St. Thomas, here are the two nursery sites. Four sites um, around these different islands, these are outplanted areas. Um, and this was again 
uh, established by the 2017 capstone project, and then these guys went back out and reevaluated it. So what they were doing is they had 12 five meter transects. They were doing transects within natural acroperid communities, so that's going to be NA. Within natural communities that didn't have acroperid cervicornis, so this is near natural acroperid, so it's reef area near natural acroperids. Um, transects within outplanted acroperid cervicornis communities, and then um, transects within near outplanted acroperid communities. So you have sort of a, a, a control to the acroperid communities. Um, and what they were doing is assessing benthic cover across the transect, across the transect, so using line intercept to do that. And then within um, different locations or different um, subsections of the transect, they were assessing vertical relief. Um, so this is the, the, their data. So I'm presenting their data, and this is how they presented it. I was going to um, ask them to change the graph around a little bit, but that's okay. It looks great. Um, so this is 20, <laughs> 2017, <laughs> and I'll just try to show you the patterns. So this is 2017 average percent coral cover, and this is total coral cover. Um, and then this is 2018 average percent coral cover, and the different colors are the different treatments. So the warm colors are the natural acroperid and outplanted acroperid. The cool colors are the no acroperid treatments. Okay. So essentially what you can see is the natural acroperid and outplanted acroperid bars tend to drop, right? Um, so there was a big loss of coral cover at those specific sites. That's primarily because this is just coral cover with acropora, just the acroperid cervicornis coral cover. Um, at those two types of treatments. And that was essentially the cervicornis was wiped out at these sites, both natural and outplanted. So we thought maybe the natural communities might do better than the outplanted. We had all kinds of ideas, but no, it was, didn't really matter. And this seems to be a general trend. Um, if you've listened in on any of the coral restoration talks since the hurricane, that cervicornis, Acropora cervicornis, which is the branching staghorn coral, does not do very well during hurricanes and perhaps should not be the focus, entire focus of our nursery operations, which up until this point, really, that's the main species that people have been working on. Um, vertical relief, interestingly enough, so again, this is vertical relief 2017 versus 2018, didn't really change except at a couple of non acroperid um, sites. We think this might be a, an artifact of the sampling and that, or that the acroperids weren't contributing a lot to the vertical relief on those specific reefs. So that was just an interesting, we need to look at this more. Their final report was due today, so I'll see how, <laughs> if they looked at it even further. Um, they really did a great job under a lot of um, challenges though. Okay, so now talking a little bit more about um, the deeper reefs, and by deeper I mean 10 meters, so like 30 feet to 100 meters. Um, really, I'm going to talk mainly about uh, reefs occurring in that 30-foot bracket. Uh, and these are dominated by Orbicella, which is the boulder star coral. And these are the focus of the Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program. So the U.S. Virgin Islands Territorial Coral Reef Monitoring Program, or TCREMP, started in 2002 and assesses coral reef resources at 33 different sites around the islands. So St. Thomas and St. John and St. Croix. We have 24 for shallow to mid-depth reefs and nine mesophotic reefs. Those mesophotic reefs tend to be on this shelf edge out here, Lang Bank over here. All of the surveys are performed on scuba, and we do benthic and fish. I'm going to show you mainly the benthic data uh, because the fish data is not quite ready yet. Uh, for the benthic data, uh, surveys include six 10-meter permanent transects that are videoed each year for cover. And then um, divers go trained divers go along, and any coral that intercepts the transect are assessed for their health characteristics. Um, this is one of our grad students, Victor, doing a, um, a video assessment at a reef at 220 feet. So we're also, UVI is one of the um, few institutions that can do technical diving. We train our students on technical diving, and we can access these deeper reef resources. But you can see this is an amazing agoristid reef um, at 220 feet. And we actually named that reef Ginsburg's Fringe for anybody who knows uh, or who knew Bob Ginsburg. We named it in his honor because he's the one who hypothesized that these reefs were there. Uh, again, it's Orbicella dominated. So for those of you not coral nerds, Orbicella looks like this. <laughs> 
It's uh, Orbicella fibulata franksi and Orbicella annularis. Um, so they are bouldery. They're not um, branching like the staghorn or the elkhorn. So these are the guys you see shallow. Um, our pro not monitoring program, sorry, monitoring program really doesn't focus on the elkhorn staghorn because we had a separate monitoring program that dealt with those guys. Um, and we haven't had funding for that program for a while, so we've really just focused on the Orbicella reefs. Um, so the reason we were able to go out after the storms at all and do any kind of assessment is because I have two collaborators, Deb Goshfeld at the University of Mississippi and Julie Olson at the University of Alabama, who, um, you know, I was kind of a mess. Like, I had just had a baby <laughs> and then, like, had to escape a hurricane. And they just called me uh, when I wasn't answering my email because we didn't have email because um, the server was down. Um, they said, you know, Maryland NSF's put out this big call for rapid grants for assessing hurricane damage. Do you want us to put one in for you? And um, we, I know it's nice, right? I, you don't really have, these are great collaborators. And I was like, yes, I don't care. Uh, we had written something, uh, a grant before, a proposal before, and they basically took that revamped it and then put it into NSF and we were funded for it, which is great. So Deb is the PI on it, Julie's the co-PI. It's focused on sponge resilience because not a lot of work has been done on the uh, impact of hurricanes to marine sponges. But we took the opportunity to look at the whole community and to redo um, the tea cramp sites. So I, Deb and Julie had been working with on sponges for quite, a, quite some time um, and we were using previously collected data funded by NSF and NOAA to do this. So we used it as an opportunity to get out to tea cramp sites and um, resurvey them. There were no hotels though, so Deb and Julie and her, their students couldn't go. Um, so we applied to get ship time and the University of Miami's, um, the Rosensteel School of Marine and Atmospheric Science, my alma mater, uh, sent their ship, the Walton Smith, so this is the Walton Smith outside of St. Thomas in December. So that was the fastest we could get out to these sites. We really didn't you know, Florida, they were able to assess their reefs within weeks of the hurricane. I would have loved to do that, but we just did not have the personnel. We didn't have the ability to do that. We just didn't have anything. Um, so December, we were able to get out and get out to some of these reefs. So of the T crimp sites, we were able to get to six. We set up some experiments too, so it took a little while. Um, and then later, since that point, we've been able to get to more sites to complete the T crimp monitoring. So the data I'm going to show you today is based on um, just a subset of the the T-Cremp sites, so 15 of the T-Cremp sites in the northern VI. Uh, we did do some sites on St. Croix, and I have a little bit of data from that. So in terms of results, um, this is as you go along the transect, the percent of colonies that showed any kind of damage from fragmentation uh, since 2002. So you can see, and here's the data from a little bit of data from St. Croix. Uh, we have had damage before from some storms, but really the percent of colonies with damage um, was pretty low, still only 5%, but really jumped up from what we normally see each year. And each year we do get some storms, we get some swell events. So there was um, major damage compared to the past, but it wasn't like 100% of corals were annihilated. Um, and again, remember this is the Orbicellid reefs. This is coral cover, it's a crazy graph. And that's because the coral cover did kind of different things. So either it stayed the same or it declined at the sites, um, but not always huge declines. So seven of the 15 sites experienced um, a relative decrease in coral cover of greater than 10%. Um, so th that's when you saw a significant decrease in coral cover. And what that usually looked at looked like, I'm going to show you some, informa or some photos from Coculus Rock. It's a nearshore site. It's really wave exposed. So this is what it looked like before. Um, this is afterwards. You can see this is one of our posts that marks the permanent transects um, at the site and it just is completely bent over. Um, so what was happening at that site is we were seeing a lot of flipped corals. So these are Orbicella uh, colonies that are pretty huge. This is a cavernosa, Montasseria cavernosa colony. They were just either flipped over or whole colonies were completely missing from the transects. So you saw a loss of coral cover, probably because not partial mortality, but really like the entire colony just disappeared. Um, and a lot of corals were found on shore. In terms of partial mortality on the actual corals, so again, this is data from the assessment of the individual corals. So we look at recent mortality, so that typically 
is stuff that appears to be very white. The tissue's just recently been uh, peeled off the coral, and that indicates a stressor that happened less than a month ago. Versus old mortality, which are these areas that um, have been sort of taken over by macroalgae. And we look at a colony, we assess what percent of that colony is uh, showing recent mortality versus old mortality. So in 2016, um, the average percent mortality, uh, recent mortality was fairly low, old mortality around 10%. We did see an increase in old mortality and an increase in recent mortality. I thought perhaps we had missed any kind of disease outbreaks, but there was still recent mortality occurring on these corals. So even though we did also lose whole corals, some of the corals that were still there were showing some damage. But it wasn't, wasn't exactly what we expected. We thought we'd see a, a lot more severe impacts. Uh, macroalgae did crazy stuff, too. It either really went up or really went down. So five of the 15 sites showed a relative decrease in macroalgae of greater than 10%. Um, these were sites that tended to be wave exposed. Um, so one I'm going to show you is Savannah. Um, this is uh, divers doing some assessments there. And if you can look closely, there is some acroalgae, but really it was just scraped completely clean of algae. Uh, and it still remains that way. Uh, we just did another cruise last month, and we've been checking on these sites. Um, more often, though, we saw a huge increase in macroalgae, and primarily Dictyota. Um, so seven of the 15 sites saw an increase in macroalgae cover of, 10, of greater than 10%. So this is um, Flat Key, which saw a 102% increase in macroalgal cover. Um, and this is the Dictyota all over the place. Um, it's growing over some of the corals. It's still there. So this was December, and we went back in March. It is still happening there. Uh, Dictyota tends to fragment and then reattach and grow. So, and it's fed a lot by nutrients, so it could be that these guys are just, you know, having a ball. You know, they got fragmented and reattached, and now they're getting all kinds of still nutrient inputs from land. Um, the sponges were badly hit. The story for sponges is pretty consistent across sites. Um, most of them, 12 of the 15 sites, we saw a decrease in sponge cover of greater than 10%. Uh, Some, it was almost you know, 50%. This is what Buck Island looked like prior to the storm. It's a really beautiful site. Um, this is it afterwards. There's just no upright sponges. All the sponges were ripped up. And actually, people were telling me, because um, it took two months for us to actually get back to the island, that they were finding, you know, all kinds of sponge skeletons all over the, um, all over the shoreline. So that's, we're, uh, Deb and Julie are working on the sponge species information, the diversity and biomass, and they're going to have a lot more information than just sponge cover. But the sponges really were affected. I mean, they're really important members of the community, uh, providing food, um, uh, you know, homes to lots of marine organisms. So we're not sure what the impacts are going to be. Um, we did see baby recruits of sponges when we went back in, Mar in March, so they are recruiting back faster than corals can. Um, but we're going to see the dynamics of them with the macroalgae cover, so it should be really interesting. In a year, we should have some of that info. So in summary, um, there was a loss of coral cover at some sites, and uh, we saw increases in the amount of mortality on the corals that were there. Uh, the changes in macroalgae were pretty site dependent. You know, sites that were exposed to a lot of wave action were totally denuded of macroalgae, but a lot of the sites saw increases in macroalgae. And then there was severe impacts to sponge cover. Um, so I just wanted to put this in perspective, though. So we have had a monitoring program in place now since 2002. It's got an incredibly rich um, database of information. Um, and one of the events that we can compare the impacts of the hurricanes to is the 2005 mass bleaching event. So if you don't not familiar with it, back in 2005, we had a huge pool of warm water that sat over the northeastern Caribbean for quite some time. And in fact, um, that year also produced some really impressive hurricanes. So Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005. It was driven a lot by this warm water. Uh, all of those hurricanes, however, went around the Virgin Islands. The Virgin Islands did not get hit by a single hurricane in 2005, and that may have been a bad thing, actually, um, because hurricanes do at least cool down the water. Small ones cool down the water. <laughs> we don't need to be hit by Category 5s anymore, thanks. Um, but um, those types of storms do turn up turbidity, and they cool down the water. Uh, unfortunately, in the Virgin Islands, that's not what happened. They didn't get hit by anything, and the warm pool of water just sat there, causing mass coral bleaching. 
So those of you, I don't know how many coral nerds are in the, in the house, but if you don't know, um, corals have a really important symbiotic algae that lives in their tissue that gives them their color. When they get stressed out, especially heat stress, um, they lose that algae. The coral's still alive, but it's in a very stressed state. You, they lose the algae that gives them their color. You can see straight to their skeleton. That's called coral bleaching. Coral bleaching tends to be caused by not just the immediate temperature, but the accumulation of thermal stress through time. This is a chart from NOAA Coral Reef uh, Watch from 2004 to 2005. This is the sea surface temperature from um, satellites um, through that time. Here's the um, typical bleaching threshold for corals. And down here, on this side, you have what's called DHW, which is degree heating weeks, or a measure of thermal stress occurring. Um, when you start to see bars of red and yellow, that means the corals are under a lot of stress and you're likely to see bleaching. Um, DHWs greater than four cause mass bleaching. DHWs greater than eight cause mass mortality associated with bleaching. So this is for the virtual station in the Virgin Islands over 2004 and 2005. And you can see there was just a huge amount of thermal stress that was not alleviated by any passage of storms. Um, there was major bleaching that year in the Virgin Islands. The bleaching went on into November, into December. Um, finally, the corals recovered around December, the majority of the corals, but in April they started to see outbreaks of disease. So this white is no longer bleached tissue, it's actually mortality. Um, and we were even seeing uh, odd colorations into August of the following year. So it was a very severe event affecting the corals. Um, we published some of this in 2013. So here you have um, percent bleaching, the white bars, and percent disease. So this is on the corals. The, so there were mass outbreaks of disease um, in 2006 after the bleaching event subsided. Uh, important here are the green circles, which is percent coral cover. So coral cover, which was up very high across the Virgin Islands, um, really dropped at many of these sites, and they almost lost half their coral cover. So it was a very, very severe event. Um, this is These bars represent percent old mortality on a coral. Um, so old mortality has kind of remained high since that event. So if we want to put in perspective the impact of the hurricanes compared with this mass bleaching event, um, it's really not much of a competition. So this is the change in coral cover relative change in coral cover from that mass bleaching event versus relative change in coral cover from the hurricanes. So yes, we did see impacts from the hurricanes, but um, this thermally driven event um, dropped the coral cover by much greater amounts. Was that for both shallow and? This is for shallow, okay. yeah. So this is focusing on shallow. We have a separate paper on the mesophotic reefs, but they also didn't do very well. Um, so they, they are not refugia for thermal stress in the Virgin Islands, at least. Um, but we haven't just, we just haven't been able to get all of the data from the mesophotic reefs yet. Um, macroalgae cover. Uh, the hurricanes really promoted a huge amount of macroalgae in the Virgin Islands compared with the, the, the thermal um, event, the, the 2005 bleaching event, increased macroalgae, mainly because the corals died back so much to give area for the macroalgae to come in. In terms of sponge cover, okay, sponges like thermally driven events because they get more space to take over from the corals. Whereas the hurricanes, yeah, they didn't like the hurricanes. They took sponges like this and just shredded them. Um, so sponge cover was really badly affected. So that's just to put in place, you know, uh, perspectives about hurricanes are natural components of these coral reef ecosystems. Coral reefs in the Virgin Islands and in the Caribbean at large have experienced hurricanes in the past. Uh, they've evolved strategies to deal with hurricanes in the past, but they haven't necessarily evolved strategies to deal with thermal stress combined with lots of other stuff happening at these different sites. So I just want to show you and tell you a couple of stories about different sites. So um, one site called Botany Bay on the west end of St. Thomas. Uh, this is its coral cover back to 2005 when we started monitoring, or, or when that thermal bleaching event was. You can see it did experience a decline in coral cover, and then it chugged along. So there wasn't much recovery. And then in 2014, it started to drop again 
or started to drop. And that was around the same time they started um, a luxury development at Botany Bay called the Preserve at Botany Bay, which makes it sound all environmentally friendly, right? Uh, and they have tried to keep sediment fences in, but you can see this is Botany Bay um, in 20, 2007, and they've been just cutting lots of, I outlined in red, some of the new roads in there. And some of those roads, including this one, um, are still unpaved, so they were open after the storms. And so sometimes the bays in here, our coral reef sites right about there, are just chocolate milk because um, whenever it rains, it brings all that sediment in. So Botany's Bay has got some other stuff going on, like development. At Savannah Key, which is one of our offshore keys, the key does not have any development on it, but 2005 saw a huge decline in coral cover. Um, it was chugging along okay until 2009 when we started to see overgrowth by this crustose um, algae that belongs to the Paysanelia family called Ramacrusta. Um, and since then, coral cover has been steadily declining at Savannah, which is one of the most protect well, it's not protected, but it's protected from human influence just by the way of where it's located. So Ramacrusta, I don't think that this is a problem yet in Florida, or I haven't heard about it. It is in Puerto Rico, and we're assessing it now in the Virgin Islands. We have a project to look at it. But it's this brown macroalgae. It's really crusty. If you lift it up, it's actually the skeleton underneath is dissolving. Um, and it actively overgrows corals like Orbicella, um, including corals like Malepora. So fire corals, it's overgrowing. It's a really strange species. It's happening at a bunch of our sites. Um, if you look at, this is um, Ramacrusta, coral cover, epilithic algae, and macroalgae at that site, Savannah, since 2003. So here's the 2005 bleaching event. You can see coral cover dropped. Uh, or sorry, that's not coral cover. That's algae. Um, coral cover dropped 2006, and there's that decline again. And you can see when this starts to decline, here's Ramacrusta, just starts, once the 2005 bleaching event happened, it just started to tick up and up and up and up. And Savannah is one of three sites that this is happening. Uh, where this is happening, we're not sure what's happening, why it's being driven like that. Um, we have a graduate student now who just defended um, her thesis proposal, and she's gonna be looking at competitive dynamics of this algae. And hopefully working with De my other collaborator, Deb Gottschall, to look at um, some of its chemical properties. Uh, looking at Megan's Bay. So Megan's Bay was that area, that tourist destination I talked about early on. Um, it has really low coral cover to begin with. Um, that just has never come up. It looks like it was a fantastic reef once. Um, but Megan's Bay, we think, was um, heavily developed a long time ago, even before the monitoring program began. And its water quality has just been terrible. You can see remnants of a really great reef there. This is where the monitoring location is. Um, but this is what it typically looks like to dive at Megan's Bay. So those corals have some serious issues facing them at Megan's Bay, and I'm not sure that it's really you know, ever going to tick back up in coral cover. So yes, hurricanes are damaging, um, but the coral reefs have evolved to deal with hurricanes and would likely recover from them if they weren't faced with tons of other stressors. Um, and this is the issue. It's multiple stressors affecting these reefs, causing lots of, um, causing a lack of resiliency, essentially. So we're seeing reefs like this. This is Flat Key off of uh, St. Thomas. And no, this is not Flat Key. This is another just dramatic photo that I put in there. It's actually from Florida. But we're seeing more and more, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> we're seeing more and more of these changes where we lose coral cover and they turn into macroalgae reefs. Uh, it's really depressing, and before, you know, about when I started grad school, um, I would say, you know, okay, well, we shouldn't, you know, we should just make sure that we know what's happening there and monitor this and, and understand the dynamics of it. But now I've been thinking about more active approaches because it's just getting to be a very dire situation in a lot of these places. So how do we go from this back to this? Um, so I mentioned we took over coral nurseries from the Nature Conservancy. Those coral nurseries were primarily focused on Acropora cervicornis, uh, but through some lessons learned, so this was the webinar, webinar that was hosted um, by the Reef Resilience Network, uh, where people shared their lessons learned from the hurricanes from Florida, the Virgin Islands, Puerto Rico. We know that we need to diversify our nurseries um, and maybe take some of those nurseries and put them on land and try techniques like microfragging, 
which um, has been demonstrated to be um, an effective way to grow corals very quickly, uh, like orbicellids that don't like to grow very quickly in, in the field. So um, one of the things we've also been doing in the Virgin Islands has been um, trying to put in place plans to respond to things like bleaching events and coral disease outbreaks. Um, Jeff Maynard, actually, he and I put in a proposal to NOAA CRCP to make a, um, a disease outbreak plan for the territory. I don't think it was funded, but we've been plowing ahead anyway, talking to the um, territorial managers about what we could do if a coral disease outbreak happens in the Virgin Islands like it did after the 2005 bleaching event. Um, TNC has been working to finalize a bleaching response plan, and we've been scoping that disease response plan. So these response plans include early warning systems, tiered impact assessments, management actions, and communication plans. A lot of that requires money, so we've actually been focused mostly on how do we do this cheaply, <laughs> and how do we get money for it if it does happen. Um, and this is primarily because the Florida Keys are experiencing massive disease outbreaks, from what I understand. And um, they were not totally prepared for it, so they've been in a lot of response to it. Uh, we would like to not have that happen. So we're trying to uh, get in front of it and figure out plans for this. Um, so that's some of the things we're trying to do in the Virgin Islands. You know, a lot of people um, say that coral nurseries may just be a Band-Aid on the Titanic, or wait, the deck chairs, rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. And that may be true, but it's also a great communication mechanism. Um, since we've started taking over the nurseries, and we've been talking about doing a citizen science program associated with it, we have a bunch of dive shops that are really getting excited about that opportunity. And if we just get people talking about it, maybe they'll start talking about protecting the reefs from land-based sources of pollution, too, so that they don't see you know, the same impacts that we're seeing. Um, today at these different reefs. So just to summarize, the long-term monitoring has given us a really good perspective on how these, you know, what is the impact of these hurricanes in relation to other things happening in the territory. Um, and hurricanes do damage reefs. I'm not, you know, they damage the acroperid reefs a lot. Um, that's not the main focus of a lot of our monitoring, unfortunately, but we did have that data from the graduate students. Uh, but we really think that the, these hurricanes are natural components experienced by reefs, and these mass bleaching events have been happening more frequently and are not necessarily natural for these reefs to experience. Um, so that's the real danger. And other factors are preventing these reefs from recovering from these large impacts. These multiple stressors that we're putting onto the coral reefs are really affecting them and their opportunity to recover. Um, and really, we need to start thinking about actual active management of reefs and potentially restoration, uh, which I, you know, you know, I was a scientist, or I am a scientist. Um, I didn't want to really get into restoration that much, but I'm, I'm sort of being dragged into it by necessity because I think it may be the, the future for restoring some of these reefs. You know, testing corals to see if we can make more super corals that we can put out there that are more resilient to these factors. Um, so it may be necessary that these are the techniques we use to prevent a total loss of our reefs. So that I need to um, thank a bunch of people, including Tyler Smith, who's the coordinator for TCREMP, and Rossi Ennis, who's a fantastic technician associated with TCREMP, and the whole TCREMP team that's been working for 16 years. We've had a lot of people rotate through. So also my collaborators on the grant and the research crews participants. Um, and if you want more information about what I do in my lab, you can visit the website or um, look us up at UVI. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Back. So you mentioned the Northeast, did it get you on or off the island? I don't yeah. remember. Yeah.